Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the unsolved homicide of Athena Hogan. Uh, Athena Hogan was an 11-year-old fifth grader from Lalton, Oklahoma. And she essentially went missing October 1st, 1986, but she was found that same day, only a couple hours after she was reported missing. Um... Very little information out there on this case. Probably the least that I've ever seen. I think it would be close between... I think the previous one would have been maybe Joanne Dunham. But this has less even than that. So let's get into it. Um, the information that I did get, a uh, Facebook subscriber had sent that information to me and requested some information on this for me to do a video a lot of uh not i, I got all my information pretty much from ancestry.com it's very important to grab uh addresses for visuals uh, of the overhead of where this happened in addition to some newspaper articles that was it so let's get into it a little uh Athena, who is known as Tina Hogan. Let's look at her victimology, okay? As a, as a child, you would think that your victimology, your chances of being a victim are small or minimal. But that can change depending upon the environment that you're at. Let's say you have a child who's 11 years old and she lives in, and this is just to, to illustrate my point, Let's say she lives in a, a gated community that is for sexual offenders. Well, of course, she is going to be a high-risk victim, not on any fault of her own because of the circumstances. So you have to take that into consideration. Normally, a child would be a low-risk victim. But in this case, I think her risk is elevated because of a situation that she's in. And the situation is that her grandparents are raising her. Now, that alone doesn't mean anything, right? Because there's been great people who survived and thrived in life that have been raised by their grandparents. Yet, it seemed that at least the grandfather, there were some issues with him. Meaning, I'm not, I don't see anything uh, sexual related in his background. But there was indications at trial that he may have been heavy handed where he would hit Tina, disciplining her. And listen, I got hit when I was a child and my friends did too. I got hit in school by the principal. So, I mean, back then it was more acceptable than it is now. But the, pro or the defense at trial, because somebody was arrested for this, but they were later acquitted. And we'll get into all that. But at trial, the defense attorney had put on that Harry Hogan, who was Athena's grandfather, would berate her, hit her with a board or something one time, maybe a belt. She would come to school dirty and complaining about her grandfather. She ran away, which surprised me at that young age of 11 that she was able to run away and but she would just go to a friend's house or something nothing far but it was because of conflict with the grandfather now in any homicide that you look at that's the very number one first thing that you need to look at where is their conflict right you ha you have to look at that first and then if that doesn't bear out, then okay, then we move out to other areas. But look where there's conflict. And there's conflict here. So we have to look at it. 
Now the grandfather was a suspect in this case, and I believe he still remains. But when we look at the body of Athena, will it tell us, yes, you know, let's look down this grandfather route, or does it lead us away? But we're still in victimology. Tina Hogan, she is raised by her grandparents because, according to her grandmother, the child's mother was 14 when she gave birth. Now, I don't know whether the mother stayed in her life. Again, I don't know anything about that. But I just know that Tina Hogan was living with her grandparents who were raising her at this juncture of her life. She had conflict with the grandfather and she had run away. Now, on this particular day, October 1st, 1986, she tells her grandparents, at least the grandmother, that she is going to sell candy bars for a fundraiser for her school. Now, first thing I want to do is pull up an aerial view of the area where she's at. Is it heavy, heavily populated or no? You know, think of Darlene Holt's case. Very secluded. Well, this is direct opposite of that. This is a very populated area. Has a little neighborhood there where she's at with a lot of houses. So she's going to sell candy bars. This is at 4.30 p.m. She's not home by 7.30. Her grandparents allegedly became worried. And so they started looking for her. Some indications in the newspaper said right then they called police. But others, which I believe to be more accurate, said that they didn't call the police until 10.30 that night. I don't know which one, but I've, see, I've seen both. But regardless, they can't find her. And then her body is discovered by a passing motorist at 9 p.m. So look at that time frame. 11.30 p.m. She goes to sell candy by foot. <clears throat> and by 9, she's dead and her body is, is found. So you basically have, what, four and a half hours there that something took place. Hey, that's a great timeline to start start working with, right? Um, th that's much better than she went missing October 1st. We don't find her till October 20th. And then you have this big gap that you're trying to narrow down. Here, we have a four hour, four and a half hour window. So where did she go? First thing you need to do is neighborhood canvas. Hey, did she come to your house? Did she come to your house? Does she selling candy? That's what she said. Now we don't know that to be true. Okay. Again, victimology would tell you, is she a liar? Children at that age can lie. Was she going to be hang with friends? We don't know. But she did have candy bars and money with her, according to sources. So, I mean, is it possible that she's lying and she created this ruse and she went and met with somebody or ran away? Sure. But at 11, maybe we should take her for what it's worth. And she was actually selling candy. There's no reason that I see to not believe that. Right there elevates things a little bit for me because that's dangerous. Okay. 11 year old going to this populated area door to door. You don't know everybody and you're selling candy. Um, she basically is found by a passing motorist, nine o'clock at night. And this gentleman's name was, and I, again, I don't use names much, but when they're out there publicized, uh, I will. And in this instance, um, everybody that I'm going to talk about here, I believe, is already deceased. Now, they have family, for sure, and I don't want to offend them, but I'm putting out there what is already in the newspaper or was in the newspaper. So she was found by a passing motorist named Robert Taylor. He says that he was out artillery watching. So to me, that tells me that 
a base of some sort is nearby. And I think Fort Sill. And he discovered this body alongside the road. I don't have much of an issue with that. He called police right away, uh, waited for police to come. They discovered Tina Hogan's body. Now let's look at the body because that is going to give us the most clues. Okay. She is found wearing, I believe, just a pink t-shirt and socks. Okay. No pants, no underwear. It's October 1st and it's in Oklahoma. I did not look up the weather, which I normally do, but I'm assuming that it was chilly out. Where was her jacket? But none of that matters because she doesn't have any pants. She doesn't have any underwear. Um, so I don't, I don't care whether she had a jacket or not, but I normally would have looked that up inside her mouth is a folded wash rag. Okay. And medical, the autopsy and the medical examiner afterwards concluded that she died from suffocation, which is important. She died from the rag, the washcloth being shoved in her mouth. Okay, that's what we know. But there's other small clues on the body that we must take into consideration when we're trying to figure out what happened here. Such as the medical examiner said, not only was there a rag stuffed in Athena's mouth, she had adhesive tape as if tape had been on her mouth and then it was removed. Good clue. Okay. He also stated that her hands were bound and possibly the ankles as well. Now, right off the bat, what strikes me is okay. Where are those and why are they not there still? Right? You have the washcloth in the mouth. That's the cause of death. That is still there when the body's found. Yet, the medical examiner is saying, hey, tape was on her mouth. It's no longer there. She had bindings on her wrist and possibly her ankles, and they're no longer there. Yeah, wh where are they? Sure, but why are they not there now? That's a big question mark. So what I want to do is I want to look at what type of murder this is. Greed, sex, or revenge. Medical examiner said at trial, this child died of horrific child abuse. She was beaten as well. No fractures of bones or anything, but she did have bruises and the child was beaten. Child abuse is what the medical examiner said. Well, when I see that and I hear that, I jump back to the grandfather. Now, the grandfather, I did a little bit of background on. I seen he was a veteran. I seen he's been arrested. He had a, a handful of arrests for different things. Did not look like she lived in the best environment to me. But I don't know the people, so I reserve judgment. Somebody might get a hold of me and say, hey, I know them, and they were great people. A witness at trial said, hey, after the body was found, the grandfather was in our store, and he was mumbling incoherent like he was on medicine, but he was saying she wouldn't stop crying. He shoved the rag in her mouth. I don't know what to make of that, okay? You can take that for what it's worth. But what I will tell you is this. Based on what I see on the body. Okay. Initially, I'm looking at Mr. Hogan, your grandfather. There's conflict there. He's mumbling. He's, you know, he's acting strange after the death. He has a background. He is a, a veteran. It doesn't mean too much to me, but depending on where he was at, you know, the level of violence that he could 
potentially have. Hey, listen, a background on this individual would tell you all that. You go to his high school, you go to his uh, workplace, they'll tell you whether he's violent or not. I didn't have, obviously, an opportunity to do that because I'm not investigating this case. I'm just giving an assessment of what I see. And I initially am thinking, hey, he got into it with Athena over something, and he beat her to death. That's a logical inference, right? But if you look at the body of Tina and you look at greed, sex, or revenge, I think we can rule out the grandfather. And because of the way she's dressed, she's missing her underwear, she's missing her pants. Now, the medical examiner, and this is very important, said that she was not sexually assaulted. Again, so when I read that, I went back to the grandfather, child abuse. But that's not the case here, okay? She's missing her, her underwear, her pants. Why? Why would a child be missing these very important pieces of clothing? It's not a shoe that she's missing. It's not a glove. It's pants and underwear. I mean, you could say, well, when she died, her body released and maybe she defecated or urinated. And so the pants were removed. Yes, but she still was not sexually assaulted. So why do that? The only reason in my mind that the pants were removed is because she was, it was a sexually motivated crime. Listen, an 11-year-old kid <clears throat> who has no enemies and they end up dead somewhere, you know, sure, there's possibilities of child abuse. It's happened in the past. A schoolmate, you know, a fight kills her. Yes. But you would, you know, you see stab wounds, you see... Uh, a petechial hemorrhaging of the eyes because she was strangled, uh, she was shot. That's different. She has a rag shoved in her mouth and her underwear and pants are missing. Now, that still could lead credence to child abuse, especially with the rag shoved in the mouth, the washcloth. Hey, shut up. I'm talking to you. Whatever it is. It certainly could be child abuse. But the absence of the pants and underwear tell me, eh, I don't believe that. Now, if it was a younger child, say a six-year-old child, five-year-old child, and she wet herself, and it upset the grandfather, the grandparent, so bad, they removed and ripped the pants off her, ripped the underwear off her, disciplining the child. She's crying, shoves a washcloth in her mouth to shut her up, and she dies. Yes, possibility. Yet. What's missing still that we haven't really gone into the bindings i don't see an abuse in that scenario of urinating and getting beat that you're going to bind the child shove a washcloth in her mouth and then put tape over listen it's not one thing it's the totality of everything remember i always say that because that's what you have to look at and when you look at the totality of everything, greed, sex, or revenge, this is sex. This is a sexually motivated crime. Now, let's get into the evidence that they found. On the child's body, they found numerous carpet fibers, much like Wayne Williams, the Atlanta child murderer. And they found pubic hair. So again, that pubic hair on the body, not just one, there was many, leads me to believe it's a sexually motivated crime. Could she have picked up that pubic hair anywhere? Sure, she could. But Bigfoot could be living in my backyard right now. It's possible. It's just not probable. So when I take the bindings, the tape, the gag, her missing her underwear, missing her pants, and pubic hair 
found on her, there's no doubt in my mind that this was a sexually motivated crime. So, remember the guy who was out artillery watching and found the body? This happened October 1st. On October 4th, they arrest this guy. Just three days later. Hey, we're, we're arresting you. Based on some footprints that they found inside and outside of the car that they said were a child's footprint. Now, I don't know what this guy said in an interview. I believe he was a college student. But I know what he said at trial. Hey, I, I, I'm just telling the truth. Yet he was arrested. Now, he was only arrested, I think, or spent one night in jail. Then he got out because they conclusively said, hey, that, these footprints of this child in his car is not... Athena Hogan's. Now, how they came up with that, whether it was size, what it is, I don't know. But it seemed to conclusively get rid of him as a suspect. He ends up suing the police department. Now, I don't know if he won. I, I don't know. But one of the things that is very important that he said in his lawsuit is that, hey, I'm being shunned now. Everybody looks at me as I'm a murderer. In my whole career, he was, I believe, a juvenile <clears throat> caseworker or something. These people ruined me. Now, don't I preach about that all the time? Every day, it seems like in a video. You can't arrest somebody unless you're 100% sure. Even if he spends one day in jail, and then all of a sudden you're like, you know what? He's wrong. Let's release him. Big deal. You already ruined his life. And he has every right to sue these people for what they did. I just don't understand that. What that tells me is that this investigation was, I don't want to say shoddy. I will say rushed. They are rushing to make an arrest without getting all of this information back. Hey, wait till the pubic hair analysis comes back. The carpet, you know, wait. So what they did do is they went and took, I want to say it was like 200 carpet samples from everybody in the neighborhood where she was selling. Now, again, I, don't, I didn't see anything where... People talked about seeing her at different places. But they did find an individual whose name was Harvey Templeton. Harvey lived, as you can see here, about a block and a half away. They took carpet samples from him, and guess what? They were consistent. They matched carpet fibers that were found on the body. So they asked him for pubic hair samples. They got that, and they were similar as well. And Mr. Harvey Templeton, who was a, a sanitation worker, and I believe he was a veteran. My background that I looked at him, he was born in North Carolina. He had moved to that area. I'm assuming it was because of Fort Sill, but I'm not 100% sure. But he was arrested. And he was arrested November 8th. So literally one month after this murder, they've arrested two people, released one, and now Harvey Templeton goes to trial. Jury deliberated for one hour. They come back and they acquit him. Not guilty. Now, Am I surprised at this? No, because again, I believe the investigation looked rushed. They're looking to close this out. It's a heinous crime. We, we've got to arrest somebody. It's the wrong way to do an investigation. You have to be sure 100%. Because if it was Harvey Templeton, you just lost your shot. 
let's say he's acquitted in 1987. Let's say in 1990, he's caught in a hotel and he murdered another girl. Well, listen, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, then he killed Tina Hogan, but you can't arrest him for that now. Just like uh, Jordan Vandersloot, you know, he was a suspect in the Natalie Holloway case, and then he ended up killing somebody else. And it just confirmed, at least in my mind, well, he did do and kill Natalie Holloway. So he's acquitted. He never moves from what I saw. He never moved out of the area. He stayed there. I don't know the background that much of what type of person Mr. Harvey Templeton was. But the carpet fibers at his house that matched what was on her body were unique. They were like a, a certain color. I want to say lime green or something sticks to me. Harvey Templeton said, yes, she was at my house. She normally plays with my children. But she never came in that day. But she was there at the front door. Now, when I read that, that gave me a certain type of feeling. Because... On the surface, I would say he's telling the truth, potentially, you know. That is something I could see. Yet, I know criminals minimize, meaning they tell a bit of the truth so it makes sense to them, but they leave out the heinous part. So, or, well, he could be saying it because somebody saw her at his house. That drove by, walked by. So he has to say that. He has to say, yes, she was there. But she never came inside. Now, the carpet fibers being on her body, she had been in that house before. It talks about her playing with his children. I didn't see anything about his children. How old were those children? And more importantly, were those children there that day? I saw nothing about that. That's very important because what the, if they were not there, what does that do? That gives Harvey Templeton opportunity. Okay. When I go back to the body of Athena Hogan and the tape, the bound, this is a sexual fantasy of the offender. Remember, she was not sexually assaulted, but she was bound. Now, there's only two reasons to bind somebody. One, to keep them captive from moving. Two, sexual fetish. The offender that I would be looking for would be somebody that has a porn stash of, in 86, books, VHS tapes of bondage. And if I found that and coupled it with the carpet, you have your guy. I don't know what they found in Harvey Templeton's house. I don't even know if they did a search warrant there. I never, I never saw that. I just know he was arrested because of the carpet fibers. The defense attorney says, hey, so what? He's been in the house. She's been in our his house before. Who cares if a pubic hair is there? The pubic hair could have came from anywhere, sure. But remember, she said she never went in that. He said she never made it inside the house that day. So those carpet fibers and that pubic hair had to have stuck on her body, her clothing, from a different time in the past when she was there. Now, to me... That's a bit unlikely. Again, possible. Remember Bigfoot in my backyard? But not probable. Now, I will say I was surprised when I was looking on Ancestry.com and I was doing my research on Harvey Templeton and I find that uh, a couple photographs of him. And... People make the mistake all the time of saying, well, they don't look like they could do such a horrible deed. 
And my first instinct when I saw a picture of him was the same thing. But listen, we all know that that's not true. Ted Bundy did not look like a killer either. Killers just don't look like killers. You know, that's not how this game works. So... This is definitely a sexually motivated crime. And whoever did it was into bondage. Her not being... And now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, Kenny, she was not sexually assaulted. The medical examiners say that. So how can you say that she was... This is a sexually motivated crime? Because of this. Remember, there does not have to be penetration for it to be a sexually motivated crime. Especially in this scenario, when somebody's hogtied uh, or bound, gagged, that's a fantasy. So the guy sits there and he masturbates to it. That is the fantasy. Now, you might not be able to wrap your head around that and say, well, that is just insane. Well, yeah. In our minds, that is a little crazy, but it happens. BTK killer did that. I mean, there's, there's hundreds. That's what they enjoy. That's what I believe happened here. Again, I thought when I initially looked at it, that it could be a, a child abuse from the grandfather, but it, it doesn't make sense. Okay. With the totality of everything, it doesn't make sense. Sexually motivated crime makes sense. The carpet fibers, where they could certainly have tracked on her from a different period of time. Now, if Harvey Templeton's children were there, I want to know the ages, and I want to know, um, you know, what they had to say. Because then he, to me, he doesn't have opportunity. But if I was a betting man which I'm not, I'm going to bet that for some reason those kids weren't there. And therefore, he had the opportunity. Now, I'm not blaming Harvey Templeton. I didn't investigate this case. But from what I see, and I take what I see with my knowledge and my experience, and I would say that this is a most likely scenario, that she came there in order to not just sell the candy, but to get her friends with her maybe to go help and they weren't there in this offender's mind he's been playing this fantasy forever maybe specifically tina but i doubt it it was probably anybody that age and i wouldn't be surprised if his own kids may have had some sort of sexual abuse or stepkids whatever he had he has the opportunity now. Sure, come on in. And that is when the assault and eventual homicide occurs. Now, the location of the body dump. And again, the carpet fibers in the pubic hair on the body indicates that she more than likely was killed on the floor. It all makes sense to me. The body dump location doesn't make sense to me if Harvey Templeton was a responsible party. Because if you look, there's a, a set of trees, woods, very, very close to his house, that he could have dumped her body there. But the body is taken a bit of a distance away and then dumped alongside a major highway. And if you look above... The north of that, look at all that empty ground. Now, why was she not taken up there? My guess is that's probably Fort Sill property. Um, so you either couldn't get on the base or you're not going to take a dead child through a century guard post to get onto a base. But it's possible that she was placed there as the offender left and kept driving on this, this road. Listen, body dump locations are, when you sit there and try to analyze why somebody took a body to a certain location, in my experience, it's very difficult. 
It's, it's very hard to understand what's going through the offender's mind and dumping a body. Because when you look at past cases, you get so many different answers. One serial killer, one offender will say, well, I did it because it, it was secluded. So I kept taking my bodies back there. Okay, makes sense. Other person says, I buried her in my backyard because I knew that nobody's going to look there. Other offenders would say, no, I would never do that because that points to my guilt if they find her. If she, they find her somewhere else, well then, and then other people say, well, I didn't want to take the chance of her being found, me being pulled over. And then, you know, there's so many variables in body dump locations that it's very difficult to assess it. So in this case, I can't offer a good reason as to why the body was dumped there. To me, it's a bad location, much like Sherry Ann Jarvis, who we just did a case on. She's dumped right alongside the road. Now, that was by a trucker. Uh, Teresa Corley was dumped beside the road. Again, I believe that possibly could have been by a trucker, but it's somebody in a vehicle. Well, here we have Athena Hogan, who was not killed in a vehicle. You know, I, she was killed in a house with a folded washcloth, you know, a washcloth. You're not keeping a washcloth usually in your car. You know, a truck driver, yeah, maybe, but um, the carpet fibers, I think, rule that out. It was a house. So the body dump location, I just, I, I, my ego's not great enough that I will sit here and tell you I know why. I don't. I don't know why he chose that. Now, maybe if I was investigating in this case and I had all the witness testimonies and things, then I would be able to figure that out, but I just can't. But it doesn't, it doesn't deter me from the fact of saying that she was killed inside a house with somebody's carpet that probably matched that whose pubic hair matched that and probably had opportunity at that particular time. Um, again, these houses are grouped together. She's on foot. Okay, She certainly could have been abducted. But to me, it makes more sense that somebody within walking distance of where she walked was responsible for this crime. Now, you got a lot of houses there, and the police know that, too. They, I'm sure, were thinking the exact same thing I'm thinking. It's in walking distance in that neighborhood. Let's go get carpet samples from all of them. And they did, and one matched. So he becomes a suspect. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, again, at trial, you can only introduce so many things. You can't introduce things that are prejudiced towards them, meaning... Uh, let's say a past instance where Harvey Templeton was arrested with a minor and he got arrested for it. Sometimes you can't bring that into the courtroom. The judge will say, no, it's prejudicial towards the defendant. We can't bring that out. The police know all this stuff. He, they know his background, which I don't know. They know his proclivities. They may have done a search warrant, I'm hoping, of that house um, and just didn't get voluntary carpet samples. And maybe they found bondage pornography books. That All that would just shore up the case for me. Everything that he was arrested on was very circumstantial. The pubic hair being consistent with Harvey Templeton's Listen, I, I was involved in, the FBI came out and there was a ruling against the FBI's um, testing on hairs. This was 2014, something like that. And a notice went out to all the district attorney's offices and we got one where Hey, if anybody was convicted because of testimony 
from an FBI lab analyst about hairs being similar, they need to be tossed because it's been proven unreliable. So I had to go through and, and find all these cases. This is one of those cases. Somebody, an FBI analyst testified that this hair, this pubic hair or hairs found on Athena Hogan's body was similar to Harvey Templeton's. Can't say it's his, but it's similar. Really, that means nothing. Now, if there's a root attached, I know a few years ago, that's perfect for DNA analysis. I'm to the point I think that they could probably do DNA on just a regular pubic hair without a root attached. And that's what they would need to do. Just to confirm this, okay? That hair could have been a trace hair for sure. But let's, let's know for sure, okay? Carpet analysis, you know, I have not done a lot of that, but I would I would rely on that more than I would the pubic hair. But the pubic hair just shows you, again, that it's a sexually motivated crime. Yeah, she's on the floor, okay? And maybe she picked up that a pubic hair off of the floor. Sure, doesn't explain why her underwear is missing and her pants, okay? Now, I'd hope that they did a search warrant at Harvey's house to look for those items, but they were probably discarded along with the body at some point in time. The adhesive teeth or tape around the mouth. Now I went back and forth on this a lot. I was trying to figure out why, why is the tape missing along with the bindings? Why aren't you just going to toss the body alongside the road, which you did, with the bindings on and the tape on. Again, I don't know for sure, but maybe the individual taped her mouth without the washcloth and bound her. And she was able to, you know, bite and move that tape. So he rips the tape off, grabs a washcloth, he shoves that in there. And maybe retaped it or just left it as it is. And she died that way because of suffocation. He's still able to gratify himself sexually, whether he has a washcloth in there or she has tape or both. So that's one possibility. You know, she bit through the tape or whatever. The tape wasn't working. Or maybe it was in conjunction with the washcloth. Shoving a washcloth in your mouth, and now I'm going to tape it because that's what I've seen in these magazines and books that I've masturbated to for the last 10 years. And now I'm implementing the fantasy. It's possible. And the same thing with the bindings. Now, what I don't understand is why those items are not there when the body's found. And the only thing that I can come up with is that they, the binding somehow would, indi would indicate that the, it would point law enforcement to the offender. Meaning, hey, if they find these, they could be linked to me. If, I, if they find this tape, it could be linked to me. So when I'm going to dispose the body, I'm taking these off. Or maybe because of the bindings, he was unable to transport the body. Maybe the bindings were affixed to an object, meaning he has ropes tied to his bed or a board somewhere. And the offender is bound that way. That doesn't mean she's bound like this. You can't tell. You just see the marks on the wrist. She could be bound like this somewhere. And so when the fantasy's over, you undo them, leave them where they are, you know, clipped to the board or whatever, and you re 
take the body and dispose of it. Those are the only reasons that I see that the bindings are not found with the body. Now, the medical examiner said he couldn't tell for sure about bindings on the ankles. But he said that it's, it's possible she was bound that way too. And they weren't found either. So it's possible that these items are in like a sexually, I don't know, like a, like a table or something like, uh, you know, or even let's just say a bed, for instance. Now I'd rule out a bed a little bit because of the carpet fibers that are found on her body. It's more than likely she is on the floor, but let's say on a bed and you have ropes down at the bottom for the ankles and you have ropes up top for the hands. And then she's bound and gagged. She can't move. And the offender masturbates to this and maybe had no intention of killing her. It was just this sexual fantasy. But yet she had chewed through the tape and started to scream. So he puts a rag in there, retapes it, masturbates. She dies and he has to dispose of the body. She now has ligature marks around her wrist, around her ankles, and he disposes of her alongside the road, and the it would explain why the ligatures are not there. Now, if you do a search warrant, I would hope that you would locate that device, and that is certainly not prejudicial to the defense, and you would introduce it at trial, but they didn't do that, so maybe, you know, maybe I'm completely wrong or off base with that. Maybe it's simply, hey, they were, I don't know, zip ties that were used for my employment. What I did for a living, I had to use zip ties all the time. So if they find these zip ties on her, they're going to link me to the murder. So I'm taking them off. I'm cutting them. Whatever. So that had me the most... Not confused, but thinking the most. Why? Why, why, why are these gone? The underwear, the pants being gone, you know, they're, they're, I don't believe they're kept as a souvenir, uh, but they could possibly be. I just think that he had to remove them in order to fulfill his fantasy. And... Uh, he disposed of them, just like he did her. Okay, let me go over my notes here. I have uh, 512 Glendale as her home address. Took a lot of trying to figure out where her house was. And then once I found that, I was able to find uh, Harvey Templeton's house. Because that, it was saying a block and a half away or something like that in the newspaper but it didn't give me an address and you could see how many houses were there so i was able through ancestry.com which is a great source to find an address and then i was like oh okay now i see the route that young athena would have taken now i see the front porch of which harvey said she was standing on um Again, very visual. I want to see those things. Um, the suspect, Harvey, remember, he was acquitted within an hour. That's not good for the prosecution. Um, he died at age 55 uh, in the year 2012, from what I saw. Again, I just feel that this prosecution, this arrest, was rushed. I really feel that and the prosecutor was even interviewed after he lost and he's saying we knew it wasn't a great case it was all circumstantial well, why'd you do it why are you rushing it don't let the public dictate to you that something has to be done in a quick manner no you're the you're the head law enforcement entity of that county slow it down 
more evidence could have been developed. I mean, you arrested him within a month. You went to trial within six months. And now, you know, he could have never been arrested again, even if he confessed. So the timeline we went over. 4.30, she left her grandparents to sell candy. 7.30, they started looking for her. And 9 o'clock, her body was found. Greed, sex, and revenge. Why? I have sex, no pants, no underwear, and pubic hairs found. The evidence that they had was hair, pubic hair, carpet fibers, and the folded washcloth, you know? I want to know, okay, does this does he have another one that matches this, the suspect? You know, that washcloth is a good piece of evidence. When you're looking for carpet samples, how about going to the bathrooms and start looking for that type of cloth from that same manufacturer, same set? Are they missing one out of the set? Same color? Things like that. I didn't see anything about that. Red flags. I have down here, no sexual assault. We talked about that plenty. It could be a sexually motivated crime and not have signs of a sexual assault. She occasionally ran away from home because of confrontations with the grandfather. Conflict. We looked at that. I ruled that out. I don't believe. Initially, it looked good. I thought, hey, this is domestic violence. Something happened inside that home. But I rule that out now. Red flags. I have Harry Hogan, the grandfather. He was a red flag for me. But we were able to look at possibilities versus probabilities and deduce that Harry Hogan wasn't involved. Some questions I have. Why was the bindings removed? We talked about that. Why was the tape on the mouth and that removed? We talked about that. This is something we didn't talk about. Her money and her candy are missing. Remember I said she had like $40, $60 and she had candy? That's gone. Now because of that, you could instinctually think burglary, robbery. But again, it doesn't take away the totality of the pubic hair, the underwear missing, the bindings and stuff like that. That was probably left inside a home wherever this occurred the assault and the murder and it was just you know, the money was probably kept but the candy was probably ditched thrown away somewhere because it, why because it links her murder to you if they find it so simple explanation for that uh, on october 4th the Ro robert taylor was arrested he found the body um, November 8th, Harvey, Harvey Templeton was arrested and later acquitted. She only had shirt and socks on, washcloth and mouth, bound by wrist tapes, suffocated, said the medical examiner. So that's it. That's what we have for uh, Athena Hogan. I, I wish there was more out there on her. I got really interested like I do in most cases when I start diving into these where I want to know more. And I wish there was more out there for Athena. I only saw one picture of Athena Hogan. And that was sent to me um, by my Facebook subscriber who this happened in her hometown. And I get a lot of requests by that. And I get it because I'm affected by cases that happened in my hometown, like uh, Brenda Condon. And it's a case that I think I want to get more involved in. But in this particular case, unlike a lot of cases, at least there's an arrest. But in this case, we're, at least I'm showing it as a, a bad arrest. Not saying Harvey Templeton is innocent. I'm just saying, listen, there's not enough evidence there for me to make an arrest. Uh, the first person they arrested, Robert Taylor, because of these footprints, you you arrest them, but then you let them go. 
I had read something somewhere that he may have had tape in his car or something, duct tape as well. You know, if I read the affidavit of probable cause for the arrest, then that would tell me why they had enough for a judge to say, yes, there's probable cause in order for them to arrest you and hold you. Um, if it was just those shoe prints and then later within a day they say no and they release him. I mean, yeah, he found the body and there are certainly cases of people that have committed the crime call in because it makes it look like, hey, I am a good Samaritan. I didn't do this. I called you. Why would I do that if I did this? So I could certainly see that. But I, I see no evidence. Goes back to West Memphis 3 case. Are those three guilty? I don't know, but I tell you what, I didn't see enough evidence to arrest them at all. I am just a big believer in not arresting, taking away somebody's liberty unless you are 100% sure. Now, some people don't believe that. Hey, you get probable cause, that's all you need. It's up to a jury. Well, we found that in the past that that is, there's people that have been found innocent because of DNA based off of your flawed logic. You have to be 100% to make an arrest. That's just, to me, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. And here you have very little evidence on either individual. It's possible, but neither of these people, now listen, just because you're found innocent don't mean you're, you didn't do the crime. It's just that the prosecution failed to prove it. It's possible that Robert Taylor and Harvey Templeton are both innocent. And it was a passerby or, or something, you know, it, somebody in that else in that neighborhood. It's possible. Um, it's possible that one of those two people are guilty and responsible for Athena Hogan's murder. And if you really believe it was this guy, let's say Harvey Templeton, you darn well better have all your ducks in a row before you go to trial. And don't and don't give all your uh, thoughts and stuff on just one simple, I don't know, like it, it, because of the carpet fibers. It, and that's all we need. No, it's, it's a lot more than that. So you, you have to understand that when you go to make an arrest and for the prosecution. The prosecution needs to understand that. Just like OJ with the glove. You can't just say, hey, we're going to rest our laurels on that glove. Well, look how that turned out, right? So that's it for Athena Hogan Deep Dive. If anybody has information on this, get a hold of me, okay? And uh, I'd like to know more about the case and the suspects. So with that said, thanks for watching. Mains out. Yeah.